In this series, we're focusing on supraventricle tachyarrhythmias, meaning tachyarrhythmias or fast rhythms, which originate above the ventricle, hence supraventricular. This is in contrast to, for example, ventricular tachycardias, which may originate from a foci within the ventricle. Examples of supraventricular tachycardias include sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. However, for the purposes of this module, we're going to focus on atrial fibrillation. Most commonly, our patients with atrial fibrillation are going to be asymptomatic. However, if they do become symptomatic, they may present with palpitations, shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, and fatigue. Additionally, these patients may present in the context of congestive heart failure, cardiogenic shock, or cerebrovascular accidents, such as strokes or TIAs. When it comes to patients with atrial fibrillation, we can divide them into categories based on the persistence of their symptoms. We have, for example, patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, in which their abnormal rhythm will terminate spontaneously within seven days of onset. In contrast, we have patients with what we call persistent AFib, in which their abnormal rhythm fails to self-resolve within seven days of onset. Additionally, we have patients who we categorize as having long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, in which their abnormal rhythm has lasted for more than 12 months. And lastly, we have patients with so-called permanent atrial fibrillation, in which the clinical decision has been made to no longer pursue rhythm control. We will see examples of rhythm control later on in this module, for example, cardiac ablation therapy. However, once we have a patient with permanent atrial fibrillation, we have essentially determined that these measures are no longer going to be effective and that this patient will have this rhythm permanently. As we mentioned at the start of this module, atrial fibrillation is an example of a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia and therefore this is going to originate from an ectopic foci that is located above the ventricle. In particular for atrial fibrillation, the most common location of origination of this abnormal rhythm is going to be the pulmonary veins. These pulmonary veins are located at this point here in this schematic on the right hand side of the presentation, and therefore in AFib our rhythm is going to originate from these pulmonary veins rather than from the sinoatrial node, which is what we would see in a normal patient. These ectopic foci located in the pulmonary veins are the basis for catheter ablation therapy in which we can ablate this abnormal ectopic foci coming from the pulmonary veins. Because of the electrical activity that is coming from these pulmonary veins, this is ultimately going to lead to disorganized atrial activity which is ultimately going to manifest as an absence of P waves on our EKG. And this is highly characteristic for atrial fibrillation. There are several medical conditions that can tip patients off and essentially put them into acute atrial fibrillation. These include pulmonary disease, myocardial ischemia, rheumatic heart disease, anemia, atrial myxomas, thyroid disease, including hyper and hypothyroidism, alcoholism, as well as sepsis. And this is something that we can monitor for our patients in the hospital when they are on telemetry in order to see if they are essentially going into AFib. And recognizing this early is extremely important, as we will later see when it comes to managing these patients. As we mentioned previously, our patients with atrial fibrillation are classically going to have an absence of distinct P waves on their EKG. Normally, we would expect our patients to have distinct P waves before each QRS. However, as we can clearly see in this EKG, there simply are not distinct P waves prior to each QRS. Additionally, on EKG, especially in the rhythms that you will see on your USMLE and shelf examinations, it should be extremely clear that these patients have an irregularly irregular rhythm. This could also be appreciated in how these QRS complexes are spaced in an irregularly irregular manner. And generally, this is most easily seen in the QRS, as when we look at one of these QRX complexes, it is simply impossible for us to predict when the next QRS complex is going to occur.
and this is highly characteristic of atrial fibrillation. Therefore, in terms of diagnosis and workup of our patients with atrial fibrillation, you're going to, of course, get an EKG and see this irregularly irregular rhythm. Additionally, we should also get a TSH as well as a T4, because as we stated previously, in terms of risk factors that can tip off atrial fibrillation, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism are very high on that list. Additionally, we should perform risk stratification for stroke. We do this using the CHADS2 VAS score. And ultimately, as we will see moving forward, this is going to help us determine whether our patients need anticoagulation therapy. As you can see from this table, in determining the CHADS2 VAS score, our patient is going to receive one point for most criteria in this system. However, there are two criteria for this A here, as well as this S here, for which the patient will receive two points in their CHADS2 VAS score. Therefore, just to go through all of these criteria briefly, if the patient has congestive heart failure, that will give them one point on the CHADS2 VAS score. If they have hypertension, this will give them one point. If they have age greater than or equal to 75, this will give them two points. If the patient has diabetes, this will give them one point. If the patient has a stroke, a transient ischemic attack, or a thromboembolism, this will give them two points. This is not surprising because the CHADS2 VAS score is essentially giving them a score in terms of their risk of developing a stroke, and therefore if they have had one of these events in the past, it is not surprising that they are at additional risk for the development of these in the future. Additionally, having vascular disease, such as a prior myocardial infarction or peripheral arterial disease, will give them an additional point. Being between the age of 65 and 74 will give our patient a point. And additionally, the final category is sex category, in which if the patient is female, then this will also give them an additional point. We then simply add up all of the points that the patient has received based on these different criteria and ultimately determine the patient's overall chads 2 vas score. Therefore, the overall management of atrial fibrillation is going to be based on the patient's stroke risk using this CHADS2 VAS scoring system. If the patient has a CHADS2 VAS score of zero, that patient is determined to be low risk, and therefore generally they are going to be on no anticoagulation or may simply be put on aspirin. If the patient has a CHADS2 VAS score of one, then that patient has an intermediate risk of developing stroke, and therefore they should be placed on anticoagulation. If the patient has a CHADS2 VAS score of 2 or more, then that patient is considered to be high risk and therefore must be placed on anticoagulation. The main concern that we are going to have, however, moving forward once we place a patient on anticoagulation, of course, is going to be bleeding as the development of, for example, intracranial hemorrhages or GI bleeds is going to be a major concern. Therefore, there is always going to be this balancing act between our patients having a stroke or having a bleed, as if we do not anticoagulate these patients, then their risk of stroke is going to increase. This is because patients with atrial fibrillation have an increased risk of developing thrombi in the left atrial appendage that can ultimately shoot off and go to the brain, thus causing a stroke. However, of course, if we are anticoagulating patient, this is also going to increase their chances of developing a bleed and therefore this balancing act between stroke and bleeds is always going to be paramount when we are managing our patients with atrial fibrillation. Now when we say that we are going to place our patients with atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation, we have a couple of options at our disposal. Of course we have warfarin. This works by inhibiting vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme complex also known as v cork one And ultimately our goal on this warfarin is going to keep our patients at an INR that is between two and three. Additionally, we can also utilize our NOAX, also known as non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. These are also known as DOAX or direct oral anticoagulants. Examples of these agents include dibigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, and of note, some studies have shown that these may have a decreased risk of intracranial hemorrhage when compared to warfarin. Additionally, these DOACs benefit from the fact that they do not need a heparin bridge, 
whereas in the case of warfarin, we will have to start our patient initially on heparin before transitioning them ultimately to warfarin. And therefore, these NOACs or DOACs are being used clinically at an increasing rate. In addition to anticoagulation based on the patient's CHADS2 VAS score, we also have two major strategies for the actual control of the patient's rhythm. These include rate control and rhythm control. In rate control, we are essentially trying to slow down the patient's heart rate, whereas in rhythm control, we are actually trying to normalize the patient's abnormal and irregular rhythm. If we are pursuing rate control for a patient with AFib, and that patient has disease that is chronic as well as is hemodynamically stable, then we can utilize beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. However, if we are pursuing rhythm control, once again in our chronic, hemodynamically stable patients, we can use either antiarrhythmic drugs or we can use procedures such as percutaneous catheter ablation in which we can ablate the patient's abnormal foci. Although we use rate control and rhythm control in our chronic, hemodynamically stable patients with atrial fibrillation, there are cases where we can also consider cardioversion. These include circumstances in which the patient is hemodynamically unstable and has atrial fibrillation, or if the patient has recurrent symptoms despite therapy, such as palpitations, angina, or symptomatic systolic heart failure, or if the patient has new onset of atrial fibrillation and it has been less than two days since this has occurred, then we can consider pursuing cardioversion. In cardioversion, we are essentially shocking the heart back into a regular rhythm. And therefore, when we do this, if the patient has built up a clot in their left atrial appendage secondary to their atrial fibrillation, then this cardioversion can ultimately dislodge this clot leading to a stroke. However, it is important to note that this clot in the left atrial appendage in patients with atrial fibrillation generally takes at least two days in order to form. Therefore, if the patient has new onset atrial fibrillation and has only had this abnormal rhythm for less than two days, then cardioversion is going to be considered to be safe as the patient has not yet had time to form this clot in the left atrial appendage and therefore is not at risk of stroke if we cardiovert them. Therefore, if the patient has new onset atrial fibrillation and it has been less than two days since the onset of this irregularly irregular rhythm, then we can proceed with cardioversion as we can ultimately convert the patient back to a regular rhythm without being worried that they have formed this clot in their heart, which would ultimately lead to a stroke if we were to dislodge it. However, if the patient has had atrial fibrillation for more than two days, or if it is unclear what the duration of their abnormal rhythm has been, then we need to get a TEE, also known as a transesophageal echocardiogram. In a TEE, we essentially put a probe into the patient's esophagus, as you can see here on the right-hand side of the presentation. This allows us to go posterior to the heart and ultimately take a look at the atria, we can then clearly see into the atria and determine whether there is the presence of a clot in this left atrial appendage. If there is no clot present, then ultimately we can proceed with cardioversion. However, if there is a clot present, then we should not perform cardioversion and should ultimately anticoagulate these patients. As if we were to cardiovert these patients and this clot were to travel to the brain, then that could ultimately lead to a stroke. And therefore, this cutoff of two days of having atrial fibrillation is important not only clinically, but also for examination purposes. We have included here a brief summary of what we have discussed here in this module. This is Boards MD, and this is atrial fibrillation.